One, two, three. Yep, I think we're good. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We begin in Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers. And I greet you, my viewing audience, with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace be upon you. Be unto you wherever you are in the world. And I greet you from the enchantingly beautiful island of Tobago, which is next door to Trinidad. And I am honored today, instead of being interviewed, I'm honored today to interview a special, special, special guest. I have met him for the first time, but I've known him for some time now, before meeting with him now in Tobago for the first time. Let me tell you something about him, first of all, before I introduce him. I have found him to be someone with a remarkable mind, a mind which is uh, not only analytical, but it is also uh, enriched with intuitive thought, because he couldn't get the insights that he had only from reading books. Oh no, there had to be something more in that heart for him to be blessed with the insights which he has. I have been reading his book, uh, The Essential Seeker, and uh, the first uh, part of the book, I think, is divided into three parts. The first part of the book, he speaks on Islam and Russia. And I've read those eight essays several times. And every time I read those essays, I'm amazed by the insights there. My only complaint against him is that the essays are too short. The essays are too short. I have to write a review of that book, but I cannot write it until I have the whole book in my mind. This is the Seka. He is Russian. His ancestry is Russian, but not Russia that was communist, not Russia that was a Soviet Union. No, 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 no. It was that Russia which was Orthodox Christian, and he is a fervent Orthodox Christian, and he is now my friend. I'm honored to have a chance today to introduce him uh, to my viewing audience. Many of you have been going, visiting his uh, website, his blog, they call it. I call it a website. Uh, the Vineyard of the Seeker. And when you find interesting essays and articles, and you send me a text, you send me a, a link. Check, read this, read that, read that. It's all from there. The Vineyard of the Seeker. He's done more than offer exceptionally valuable analysis and insights in that blog or in that website. And we have benefited tremendously from reading it. The enemies of truth, the oppressors of the world probably hate him because he constantly exposes them. He's done more than that. He's taken some of my videos and put them on his website and so many people in Russia now get to know about me. Some time ago he said to me, I need you to answer some questions and might, some of them might be difficult questions. And he sent me about 13 questions and I had to answer them. And my answers are there on my YouTube channel uh, answering the questions of the Seeker. And uh, I believe he was satisfied by those answers which I gave about Islam because he, he has shown only respect for Islam. Only respect for Islam. That's all I have seen from him. And so today, I welcome you. I know you're going to be very excited now. I welcome uh, our mother, our brother Andre, who is known as the Seeker. Welcome, Andre. Thank you so much. Thank you for your kind, if I think undeserved words of praise. It's an honor and a privilege to finally meet you. It's a big joy also for me. Andre, they want to know something about yourself. Can you briefly introduce yourself? Yes, I can. Um, it's the first time ever I speak on an interview, except to speak uh, 
under showing my face overtly. Um, I was born in Switzerland. I am indeed a white Russian. That is, that's my great grandparents who left Russia after the Civil War. Uh, but I was raised in the Russian culture. I am a traditionalist Orthodox Christian. And I used to work very much for what I call the empire nowadays. I made a career first in the military, military intelligence, analysis. I worked in the United Nations. And um, the war in Bosnia it did two things for me. First of all, it opened my eyes to the lies of the empire mm -hmm. because I could see what was written in the press and see what the internal UMPRA 4 documents were saying and other documents that I had access to. And secondly, it cost me my career as a military anal analyst because I did not keep quiet and uh, ran in a lot of trouble. So after a very difficult period um, in my native Switzerland, I moved to the United States because my wife, also a white Russian, also a fourth generation, uh, had American citizenship and she could work there. So I found paradoxically a refuge in the imperial homeland, as I call it, uh, where I became a nobody, which suited me very well. But I still wanted to analyze and write, because that's what I do. I had an itch to do that. So I began a blog, which nobody read for very many years. And uh, my blog became more conspicuous and more noticed once the crisis in the Ukraine began. Originally, if you look at my early articles, they're mostly about the Middle East, uh, mostly about uh, the Zionist entity in Hezbollah, which I have great interest for. But now it sort of became the, I think, one of the main blogs, uh, not to any credit of mine, but to, um, to the circumstances. I think like a Russian, but I write in English. So that is what made my blog unique. And I also think I'm one of the few blogs who is openly, unapologetically, orthodox, traditionalist, patristic orthodoxy is my religion. No modern Christianity. I have no patience for that. So I openly declare my positions as being patristic orthodoxy. So that's where I come from in a couple of words. Thank you, Andre. Um, if you may, if you can share with us, uh, I think our viewing audience would be, would treasure it. Uh, some of your views concerning the state of the world today, uh, a, a globalist whole uh, view of the world today, uh, and uh, in which direction do you think the world is moving? My observations lead me to believe very strongly that we're witnessing a major shift. And that shift is from a unipolar world to a multipolar world, a world where there will be no one hegemon running the entire planet. Uh, clearly, what I call the Anglo-Zionist Empire, we can call it the United States Empire, if you prefer, uh, is running out of steam, running out of strength. Uh, it's economically shattered, it's politically shattered, it's militarily shattered, which is something very new. In the past, after the war, people loved the United States, then they stopped loving it, then they feared it, and now they don't even fear it anymore. So that is a major change, and I see a world where not one regime or worldview predominates, but a diversity. Uh, these alternatives to the United States are, first of all, I think, well, clearly the world of Islam, although that's a complicated one because there are several trends within Islam which are mutually exclusive, which are fighting, but they are definitely an alternative. I think particularly of the Islamic Republic of Iran, which presents an unapologetic rejection of the Western world and says we're going to do things differently. I think the second group which I notice is clearly um, Latin America. Even though right now the um, patriotic anti-imperialist governments and um, countries are in a great deal of political and economic difficulties, the idea, the value of an independent, truly non-colonized Latin America is very strong. And obviously China is another model of development, and Russia right now is probably, for a number of historical reasons, I would think, the leader of that resistance to empire. So all these different, fundamentally different entities are all pushing up and all pushing against the common enemy and the common uh, threat, which is the, the Anglo-Zionist Empire, 
And I would add, I think that the empire is the enemy of the United States also. Uh, the American people are not benefiting from the empire. They are the victims of that empire. And I think that a great deal of those who voted for Trump voted deliberately to try to save the United States and get rid of the empire. So it's not at all an anti-American position. And I personally don't see anti-American feelings in the world. I see a great deal of anti-imperial feelings, anti-oppression feelings, anti-secularism, yes. Um, people are revolted by the kind of moral degeneracy which we witness now in the West. But I don't think this is direct to the American people. I think a lot of American people actually, I live in the United States, I live in Florida, I see a great deal of sympathy. A lot of my readers write to me and say, you know, we Americans support Putin because P Putin stands for American values. So it's a very complicated struggle that's taking place, but I think one where we, we that's what I refer to the global resistance, will definitely prevail. Andre, the uh, Zionist world maintains uh, uh, an enormous amount of its strength and its power through its control, what I consider to be control over money and the banking system. Um, and uh, Russia has been uh, attempting to respond to that uh, um, stranglehold on money and uh, the banking system. Uh, Trubrix, would you care to offer some of your viewpoints on uh, what is the significance of BRICS and uh, what likelihood is there of some success? I think that BRICS is one of many attempts to try to develop an alternative to institutions who are thoroughly controlled by the Anglo-Zionist. It's not the only one. There's a Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which has a more military aspect. There is the Eurasian Union, which has an economic aspect. Uh, but these are still countries, all of them, that are very much, they're struggling, they're standing up. None of them are firm on their feet. And I think it's very important to realize, speaking of Russia, that Russia was ruled by the West as a, as a despised colony until at least 1999. Mm -hmm. And when Putin came to power, it didn't change like this overnight. The struggle continued. The real struggle is inside Russia. And there are two forces who are fighting each other. I have my own terminology. I call one force the Atlantic integrationists. These are those in Russia who want Russia to become an equal partner, accepted in the West, possibly accepted in NATO, an equal partner respected by England, France, Germany, the United States, and those what I call the Eurasian sovereignists, of which Putin, I think, is the main one, which are those who say, you know, we will have good relationships with the West, but we're not interested in the Western model. And our cultural future is the South and the East. And they, and I consider myself part of that, we would say that the turn to the West was a fluke in Russian history due to a nobility and a, a, a regime before the revolution which was very westernized. There's a strong movement in Russia to turn away from that. Well, last year one of the best Russian observers, his name is Mikhail Khazin, said that these two groups, the, let's put simply pro-Western or pro-Eurasian, were just about 50-50 in their strength. Which means that in 16 years of Putin power he ma barely managed to get about half of the strength in the country. The Russian banks are still controlled by IMF types. Uh, the Russian economy, until very recently, was run by people who were openly, unapologetically pro-Western. It is no surprise that the Minister of Economy was called one of the best, uh, he had to receive the premium of the, I think, the best banker, central banker in the world. I mean, Russia is struggling, and the other BRICS countries are in the same situation. You see Brazil, there was a, uh, what I could call a, a state state coup against yeah. the, the president there. South Africa is in a great deal of trouble. China is struggling strong. This is a promise, this is an attempt, but all the venues, these countries realize that they have to come up with a different model, the multinational one. These are all just the first steps. None of them are by themselves viable or a solution or much less so an end re response that you know can truly stand against the power of the IMF, the World Bank, NATO and the world hegemony of the United States. This, the empire is still stronger right now. 
What is the Christian view of money? The Christian view of money, well, first of all, uh, a lot of um, uh, Christians seem to have forgotten that usury is uh, banned in Christianity. And even though it's now accepted in every single Christian country through our banking system, which is a Western one, um, Christ clearly himself said you cannot serve two, two lords. You cannot serve Christ and mammon, which is understood by some fathers as meaning money. So money can only be, uh, we accept it as a means of exchange, uh, but clearly it's not, we're threatened, uh, we're warned, I'm sorry about it, in many parables that Christ said that, you know, if you worship the money, if it becomes a source of idolatry, if your heart and your love is with that, then you end up in hell. I mean, the warning is absolutely clear. There's the uh, parable of the rich man who is in hell and who had everything, and he, now he lost. So money is, we don't have, uh, to my knowledge, as much of an emphasis on usury and what is proper and inappropriate banking practices as I believe by listening to you, Islam has. But we definitely have uh, the notion that money is something that can be a great temptation, that only the, uh, the help of God can help a very rich man enter paradise. It's possible, but only with the help of God. And we consider that when money primes spirituality, it becomes a source of uh, lapse and condemnation. This, of course, is the, the use of money in our corrupted relations with money, mm -hmm. when the heart is corrupted, of course. Uh, well, what about the definition of money in Christianity? To my knowledge, there is no definition of money. Okay. Um, to my knowledge. I, 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 um, I wonder whether I'm correct. Uh, a Christian will have to tell me if I'm correct or not. Uh, that when Jesus entered into the temple, he found the money changers ripping off the people. Mm -hmm. And he cursed them and he turned over their tables and he chased mm -hmm. them out of the temple. And he said, you've taken the house of God and transformed it into a den of yes. thieves. In other words, he was very, very, very angry yes. over what they were doing. I was told that what they were doing was changing the Roman money yep. to temple money. Mm -hmm. uh, the Roman money had graven images on it, which is not kosher, not halal. And therefore, the temple minted its own gold and silver coins. Since the temple in the time of Jesus minted its own gold and silver coins, and the people had to exchange them, would it be correct to say that Jesus himself approved of gold and silver coins as money? I don't think I can come to that conclusion because, uh, first of all, my opinion does not matter. Something which would be normative as a reply to you for us would be something that the fathers would have a consensus on. Mm -hmm. So there, sh there would have to be a consensus patrum okay. on the fact that this is acceptable money, this is not acceptable money. Mm -hmm. But I think of when Jesus was asked, should he pay tax, should we pay taxes or not? He asked for a coin and found the graven image of Caesar on it. It says, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Yeah. Um, I think that I'm not being incorrect when I say that we are taught that we're in the world, we have to operate according to the world and in respect to the laws of the world, yet we should be not of the world ourselves. So that we are, we should render unto God which is God's. Good, yeah. And there is a fundamental incompatibility yeah. between rendering um, homage or much less so worship to anything that is material of this world and are so loyalty to yeah, God. I, I, I think I, I should allow the Christian to define what, the, what is a Christian view, rather than me offering right. uh, my views on, on what is a Christian view. But what about the mon monetary system that we now have in the world today, of paper, plastic, and electronic money, which is based on the IMF and Bretton Woods? Uh, mm -hmm. would, to what extent would uh, the Christian uh, faith consider this to be valid money? Again, I am unaware of a Christian teaching saying that one form of money okay. by itself okay. is valid or not valid. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, the future of the uh, relationship between the Christian and the Muslim world, between Islam and Christianity, we are the two people on the face of the earth who look forward to the return of Jesus, the son of Mary. 
and as a consequence, I hold the view that uh, having this common belief of the most important events still remaining in history, that it is our destiny to come closer to each other. Uh, would you share this view? My view on that is uh, based on two fundamental principles and two, I consider, indisputable realities. Islam and Christianity are fundamentally in disagreement on a crucial issue, which is the issue of Christ. For Islam, Christ is a prophet. For Orthodox Christianity, Christ is the Son of God incarnate. Uh, we see it in our symbol of faith. We consider him consubstantial with the Father. We have to accept that difference and let's never, never hide it. Always proclaim, uh, it's very bad to do what I call, you know, cheap, the, uh, cheap ecumenism. List all the things we agree on and overlook those we disagree on. No, let's openly proclaim that which we disagree on and let each person in his heart decide. Once we set that fundamental disagreement apart, let's look at what's left over. And what's left over is that I see, first of all, absolutely no historical or social, social reason for any hostility. Muslims and Christians have lived together in peace in many countries, not in all, and there is this terrible example of the Ottoman Empire, which inflicted horrors upon Orthodox Christians, and the Sheikh, I think, spoke more about that than I ever did. So it's not something that Muslims like the Sheikh are not aware of. He's very much aware of it. I think in today's world, we have to take example of those time in history where we lived in peace together, and is the case today in Russia. Muslims and Russians, Orthodox, live in peace, are allied together. There are Muslim Chechens dying for Orthodox Christians in Nova Russia. So that is a very compelling example of that. We should take example historically in these historical examples and then struggle together against our common enemies. And those are absolutely clear. Um, you look at the disrespect for our different dress codes, even though they might be similar. In a certain way, the Muslim hijab is not different from what Russian m women wore before Peter the Great Every day, Rush, uh, Orthodox women still cover their heads mm -hmm. in Orthodox churches. Mm -hmm. uh, morality, uh, the issue of how we build a society, do we accept or not such notions as you know, men marrying each other, etc. The resistance to Anglo-Zionism, we have a long list of things where we completely agree. So I think the future, and that's something that the Anglo-Zionists fear very much, is that we would stand together in our common resistance to the Anglo-Zionist empire. Before we end, uh, Andre, uh, let me share with you something that is in the Quran on the subject of uh, the differences between us, and that is the belief in Jesus as the Son of God and incarnate God. Uh, but the Christian also has belief in God the Father, and God the Holy Ghost. And the Quran says, your God and our God mm -hmm. is the same God. So we leave the rest for that day when we stand before him, because he declares your God and our God is the same God. Thank you, Andre. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm honored to have had this chance to interview you, and I'm going to assure you our listening and our viewing audience around the world are going to be delighted. Yes, God willing. For this chance to hear and to see you. Thank you, Andre. Thank you so much, Chef.